in this very insightful fireside chat, I have none other than Crypto.com CEO right here in the house, Chris Marzarek, uh, to give me a crypto insider's perspective on uh, where the industry is headed. So, Chris, thank you so much for being here at the Japan FinTech Festival. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Shanjit. It's a pleasure to chat with you today. Absolutely. And gosh, you know, we know this industry, crypto, it's had such a tumultuous journey. So thank you so much for being here. What's it been like for you? Well, it's been a, um, an interesting couple of years, I would say. So um, I've been in the industry for almost eight years now. So I'm uh, uh, fully time committed to our vision of uh, driving global cryptocurrency adoption. And, uh, you know, it's a cyclical industry. So we've been now through the cycles of 2017 top, a few years of crypto winter, 2021, everybody remembers the top, the bottoming out in, in November 2022. And now we are back at almost all-time high today at Bitcoin 68,000, 69,000 during the last cycle. So mm -hmm. we've seen the industry evolve and we've seen it grow tremendously. And we are here to as crypto.com it's a platform trusted by 80 million customers globally. So we're here to help drive the industry forward in a responsible uh, manner, like uh, as a regulated platform. That's really interesting. I love the fact that you say you're driving the industry forward in a responsible manner. And that sort of echoes a little bit about what we heard earlier today. Um, someone else on a previous session, I believe it was Emily Parker, formerly of Coindesk, who says the industry really needs to just grow up. So I guess you're sitting here as an example of the grown-up, uh, you know, industry and, and where crypto is headed next. Well, look, um, from day one, we thought that if you want to take this market to, uh, to the size of a billion people, you need to have an approach that takes into account all stakeholders, including regulators. You need to have, uh, you need to think about consumer protection and all these mechanisms that uh, the market of this size uh, needs, right? Um, so we've done this uh, the right way from day one. We've always KYC'd all of our customers. We've, we run basically like a bank in this new space. So right now we've got about 500, 550 million people using cryptocurrency globally. We think that during this cycle, over the next 12 to 18 months, we'll cross the chasm to early majority and, and, and hit the 1 billion global users milestone. Um, again, this only happens if regulators are on board, if rules are clear and consumers are protected. And do you think, obviously, uh, as I said in the introduction, it, that part of it, uh, the fact that it's being seen as a more legitimate asset class is because there is now a Bitcoin ETF, because folks like BlackRock are investing. So does that mean we are seeing it potentially as a legitimate asset class? Is that the ultimate uh, hope from founders like yourself? Well, it was, uh, in my view, it had tremendous potential the moment we started um, almost eight years ago. Um, it takes a long time to get these to, to get to get to these big milestones like the uh, spot uh, ETF approval. And you know now we uh, get to enjoy the benefits of it, i.e., seven billion of net inflows as of first of March. I mean, BlackRock's got over seven billion itself. You've got Fidelity over four billion. There are two other ETFs with a billion plus, so there are really strong inflows. Bitcoin is the king of the hill in the industry, and it will drag it forward. But there is a tremendous number of very interesting projects that build uh, transformative technology. Uh, that will get access to capital and more interest and more adoption uh, because of this uh, this rally that is now um, and now happening. So I'm bullish not only on the market, I'm bullish on the impact on the technology on the society at large. You mentioned regulators earlier, so let's bring them up. They've come up a lot in these sessions, I have to say. Uh, a lot of talk at the Japan FinTech Festival uh, of the tensions between policymakers, regulators, and, of course, entrepreneurs and innovators like yourself and many of you sitting in the audience. Um, so the notion is they sort of restrict the innovation that many of you come up with. So do you think... Um, you know, you're impacted by what regulators think. How do you manage the relationship 
with policymakers and regulators and in, in the country specifically in which you operate? Right. So we are um, today uh, the most licensed platform globally in cryptocurrency space. We are CFTC regulated in the US. We've got you know 50 money transmitter licenses. We've got an electronic money institution license from FCA. We've got EMI in continental Europe, two licenses from the MAS. Um, we've got two licenses in Korea and Australia. So it's basically a globally regulated platform. And the role we play is we try to be a good counsel to the regulators to help them understand what are the most forward-thinking regulators uh, around the world doing to uh, regulate effectively. Mm. I think effectively is the key word that is often forgotten, right? The regulation for the sake of regulation does not help anybody, does not help the consumer. It certainly does not help the entrepreneur uh, who's trying to build value in the um, in the ecosystem for everybody. So you, you need to be very thoughtful about how you execute on this. And we've, uh, over the years, contributed to, as, a, as a trusted counsel to the regulators to allow them to understand uh, the inner workings of the industry and not only where it, uh, where it has been, where it is today, also where it is going so that they can um, build frameworks to, to be effective and uh, allow innovation while you know making sure that the market integrity and consumers are protected. That's right. I mean, that's a very good point, effective regulation. I mean, I spoke to two regulators earlier who were on the couch with me uh, from MAS, from Japan's uh, financial uh, services agency. So, you know, it's interesting because obviously they have to stay informed. They have to stay on top of the vastly rapid technological advances that are going on in this industry. Um, and uh, in fact, when I asked them, they said, yes, the, the key thing is they need to stay informed so they know how to react to potential fallout. Um, so how do you feel in terms of the environments that you operate in? You mentioned some countries, Singapore, Korea. Um, do you have a place where you feel like perhaps the regulators and the policymakers are a little bit more conducive to allowing innovation like yours to survive? Right, there are ebbs and flows to this, right? Uh, I think uh, historically uh, Singapore has played a role of a um, of an uh, of a regulator that I mean, is playing a role of a regulator that allows for innovation and is forward thinking and is not af afraid to put uh, you know pen to paper and and and, and create uh, frameworks that are innovative, new, and uh, you know while allowing business to um, uh, to move forward. I think in this this whole concept of uh, interregulators coming together, you know, we've we've had this uh, point zero forum in Switzerland where the Swiss regulator organized with the MAS. I think this kind of dialogue really helps. You know, you need to go into the finer details. And it's always best to do it where you can engage with the industry, uh, with your peers uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. So I think this, this, these kind of meetings, and now we've got this in Japan, I think this is very, very effective as a way, as a way to, to engage and move things forward. Um, again, in, there are other markets where, unfortunately, this, this regulatory process has been captured by politics. I always think it's a, it's a bad idea to politicize this type of stuff so it's best if we stick to you know the, the actual facts of the matter and and focusing on how to improve things rather than turning it into a political process well i'm sure sobdendu sitting in the audience is very gratified to hear that you've called mas a, an innovative regulator uh, coming up with innovative solutions and as you say you know forums like this give you a chance to interact with them uh, so that they know what innovations in fintech needs from uh, the regulator and the policymakers. Um, do you feel that because of all the, um, the tumultuous things that have happened in your industry, which I, we referred to earlier, do you feel like you have to play a particularly more responsible role now in terms of um, you know, being an, an upstanding member of the community uh, because of the way your industry has been so scrutinized. I mean, how much harder do you have to work to win investors' trust? It's definitely a great responsibility, and, and um, especially the last year and a half uh, was all about rebuilding the trust that was uh, somewhat shaken by, uh, by uh, several players uh, exiting the industry in, in not the most elegant fashion. 
Um, but I think we've made tremendous progress. And the, the important thing is when you try to evaluate who is a responsible citizen and not, you have to ignore what people say and look at what they do like really go deep into their operations and understand how they actually execute and, and whether they uh, respect uh, the rules or not. And there are certainly a few players who have been upstanding citizens in this industry with a very long operating history, some of them decade plus. For us, you know, it's been, it's, it's been seven years plus. Um, so there are partners who uh, have a deep desire to do it the right way. And we're always here to advise, to counsel, and to help drive it forward. Um, we also know that Crypto.com is pursuing a, a very aggressive M&A strategy. Uh, essentially, you're looking to give access to millions of people to the opportunities that exist in cryptocurrency. So tell us a bit about your expansion plans. As of today, we're already uh, the most licensed crypto player in, 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 the, in the industry. Uh, this whole trend of uh, TradFi and crypto converging, through things like ETF on tokenization, I think it's going to be a big one for the next uh, five to 10 years. So we want to be at the forefront of it. Uh, we've been aggressively acquiring companies that uh, hold the required licenses to uh, to do this over the last six, six, six seven months. Mm -hmm. So some of these deals are already done and waiting for change of control approvals. We have more irons in the fire. So we want to play definitely a role uh, to give people access to uh, to these unique opportunities. And in a sense, not only make the markets more efficient, but also just democratize the access to, uh, to, to fantastic opportunities for growth. Fantastic opportunities for growth. I, I want to pick up on that because I, I also want to echo uh, what was said earlier by um, the founder of uh, uh, PayTM, who was here. Uh, we're very lucky to have him, uh, much like yourself. Um, he is a founder in, in something that was incredibly innovative, but he says, actually, here in Asia, uh, consumers uh, are much more open to embracing uh, innovative products like crypto, for instance, uh, and, and much more so than the West. So would you tend to agree with that? I mean, seeing, seeing as you're based in Hong Kong, uh, do you feel like this is a much more conducive environment where we are sitting right now? First of all, um, the company's headquarters in Singapore, so we, we are happy to call Singapore home. Uh, but if you look at the, the, how the innovation happens in different areas of the world, you know, payments is a, it's a very specific use case. You mentioned Paytm, right? So obviously, what, what's been happening in China and in India it's way ahead legacy systems in the US. I mean, we've, US is our largest market today. It's over half of the business. And people use still things like ACH. It's, uh, it's ancient technology by yeah. uh, Asian standards, right? So uh, plenty of uh, work needs to happen um, to fix these broken pipes. And I think also bull market cycles are great for this. In mm. 2021, at the peaks, the peak times, you know, we managed to... Uh, because of the scale of the uh, and of the level of activity, you managed to kill so many vendors to make their systems stress test them to their absolute limits and beyond. So I think uh, uh, the next 12 to 18 months are going to give uh, the infrastructure another good test, and we will see uh, whether this will serve as sort of like a, a wake up call yeah. <laughs> for an upgrade in infrastructure in the West. Fantastic, and you are ready to take advantage of that when that happens, I'm sure. Now, we've just got a few more minutes, and what I may also do is potentially open it up to the audience at the end, uh, because I'm sure they're all dying to ask you questions. But I guess my final question is, you know, when will cryptocurrencies go mainstream? When will we, each of us here, let me just find out, how many of you own cryptocurrencies? Okay, quite a number. Well done. And but not everyone. It's obviously not a full up, uptake. When will we all in this room be in a position where, yes, I want some cryptocurrencies. I've got some in my e-wallet. When do you think it'll go mainstream? Well, we thought it was going to go mainstream in 2021. That didn't happen. I think this cycle, again, just looking at the numbers, uh, early majority to hit about seven, 800 million people in terms of population. So we will definitely cross the chasm in this uh, uh, standard typical adoption curve. Um, I think, uh, as always, you know, it, it depends on the audience. Um, and you know, if you if you ask the same question at a university in Seoul, the, uh, all hands will be raised uh, okay. high in the air, right? 
Uh, and uh, uh, since we talking about myself, we're, we're perhaps in a slightly more advanced age-wise. But you have those instruments uh, like ETF that now is in your brokerage account. You can very easily invest to it. And even if you don't do it actively, well, BlackRock just announced they're just going to put it in your balanced portfolio anyway. People will get exposure to it one way or the other. I've preached uh, that everybody should have uh, you know, a single digit at least exposure to, uh, to cryptocurrency as a part of their broader portfolio for like, more than five years, right? Now it's gonna become a fact of life for everybody. I'm obviously more interested in actual usage and you know, people you know, just uh, using the technology and its breakthroughs rather than just uh, allocating uh, money to it. But it's an important milestone for the industry and it's a necessary one. My final question, that was meant to be my final question, but I think I've got another one based off what you've just told me. What's next? So you're asking me to whip out my crystal ball. <laughs> What's next for you in crypto.com? First of all, we are very happy with the work we've put in during the bear market. I actually love bear markets more than the bull, bull parts of the cycle uh, because you can just get into the nitty gritty details and solve this. So in the last seven days, multiple platforms were going down left, right and center because of the onslaught of traffic. Mm -hmm. We were one of the few that held up and that's because we've managed to improve our system scalability like 20x the bear market, right? So now in the next 12 to 18 months, it's time to scale the company. Our goal is a quarter billion users uh, on the platform globally. So we think we have everything that we need to make this happen. The, the, executing on the strategy in terms of convergence, playing a role in convergence between TradFi and crypto is, uh, is another part of it. And this will keep us uh, tremendously busy. Anything we can do to help drive the mission of getting the whole industry to a billion users, we'll do it. Great. Well, at this point, we've got about a minute and a half. Anyone with a burning question for Chris, CEO of Crypto.com? We talked a lot about crypto exchange and exchanging things. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, in the future where we will use these instruments for paying for things? All right, so we're actually the world's largest uh, crypto card issuer with, through our partnership with Visa in, in uh, most of the regions it's, it's available. So we use this as a bridge to, to enable people to spend digital assets at um, you know, 80 million plus merchant locations in the Visa network. Um, I think uh, you know there's uh, this is sort of a way for us to solve the chicken and egg program where where you've got uh, in just solve the acceptance and then um, you know smoothen the user experience uh, in the future as the market size and adoption grows uh, even the largest merchants will natively accept crypto as a part of the checkout and cryptocurrency companies will have to figure out you know, they'll have a fight for their place at the checkout the same way any other payment method has. So, you know, how is the UX? How is the cost of the merchant? How is the conversion rate? Does it drive additional business? And what are the incentives for the consumer to pick this payment method versus their, you know, DBS issued credit card? So it's a, it's going to be a long journey, but the technology at its core is built for it. All listening to the panel uh, beforehand about a settlement across three borders happening at scale for a bond deal. Um, you know, you can send five dollars uh, from uh, Japan to South Africa. It's completely borderless for two cents, right? So this is built for payments and I'm, I'm sure that it will happen, but it will require a lot of commercial legwork, uh, not just tech. Excellent. Well said. Well, thank you so much, Chris uh, Marzalek, uh, CEO of Crypto.com here in the house at the Japan FinTech Festival. It's been a real privilege to speak to you. Thanks so much. for uh, Thank you. Yes, big round of applause.